On August 28, 1990, an extremely powerful and destructive tornado, one that no one could even see coming, literally, no one could see it despite it hitting in the middle of the day, struck and utterly destroyed sections of the city of Plainfield, Illinois, a small city platted in 1841, and several others as it tore an almost straight damage path through one after another, striking bullseye after bullseye. Despite carving a path through the ground itself and ripping through Plainfield, there was nearly no warning and no photos or videos of the tornado exist, leaving this nightmare one that is only now something like an eerie ghost that haunts those who survived and terrifies us as we try to imagine what it might have looked like. If a tornado ever embodied the fear of the unknown, this one would likely be one of the top contenders for such a title. The tornado no one saw, only, unfortunately, what it did to everything in its path. The Invisible F5. Today I'm going to tell you the story of the town, the tornado, and those who survived an attack by the monster no one ever saw. This is the 1990 Plainfield Tornado. It was even by what you'd expect for August weather in the region, a hot and humid day on August 28th. Dew points were in the upper 70s Fahrenheit, and temperatures themselves were well into the 90s, about 11 degrees above normal. The atmosphere over the region that day was unstable, and as a low-pressure system moved into the region, that instability only continued to build. Still, at first, it seemed conditions would not be ripe for any kind of tornadic event or development. However, that would change as the day went on. There was also an upper-level shortwave trough moving through the Great Lakes area, and a cold front which was forecasted to push its way south from this area and into northern Illinois. Despite initial conditions not being seen as the most favorable, perhaps, most of the ingredients for tornadoes were there. Moisture, a source of lift, instability, and wind shear. By 1.30 p.m., a severe thunderstorm watch was issued by the National Severe Storms Forecast Center, or NSSFC, for northwestern Illinois, predicted to last through 8 p.m. However, less than two hours after the watch was issued, the developing supercell would spawn a destructive tornado. NSSFC predicted that a derecho-like event was imminent for that night as thunderstorms were rapidly developing. One of these grew into the supercell that birthed its sinister spawn shortly after 3 p.m. As this storm developed, supercell characteristics, conditions began to change, and tornadic development began to look more and more likely as it moved south of Rockford. This supercell produced multiple tornadoes and funnel cloud sightings, hail damage and severe winds south of Rockford, before moving southeast towards Will County. While there are no photos or videos of the tornado itself, this video, which surfaced in 2011, is footage of the supercell around 30 minutes before it dropped a large, rain-wrapped tornado. You can see the conditions of the day, the intense wind and rain. These are what would shield the tornado from view and why it would have been all but impossible for anyone to see the tornado. And due to a lack of advanced warning, most people were totally oblivious until it was already right on top of them. The supercell spawned several short-lived tornadoes before birthing the invisible monster. At 3.15 p.m., within a spinning core of rain and whirling wind around it, the tornado that would strike Plainfield began to descend to the ground. It touched down in Kendall County and quickly grew into an F2 and then F3 as it moved into Will County. 
as it tore through some townships and farmland and only grew stronger, finally reaching F5 strength, leaving extremely intense ground scouring behind in its wake. In some places, crops were ripped out of the ground by their roots, leaving only bare soil where they had been, along with several missing inches of topsoil. As it crossed US-30, a 20-ton tractor trailer was thrown more than half a mile through the air by the tornado. The driver did not survive, and three other motorists were also killed in the same area. It's possible that none of them even saw the tornado due to it being rain-wrapped. All they would have seen would, would have been the rain flying through the air in a blinding cloud, and then it would have been too late. The tornado then weakened slightly, as indicated by the ground scouring, to high-end F4 strength, which is not really much of an improvement, as it moved into Plainfield, hidden within the shadows of its wall of rain. At around 3.30pm, the tornado had reached Plainfield and struck the Plainfield High School. A science teacher and two other workers died there, and many others would have extremely close calls with the tornado, some almost close enough that they could have reached out and touched it if they dared. Like with the Xenia tornado, students were forced to run to shelter only minutes, seconds in some cases, before the tornado struck. Football players on the field were forced to run inside as the storm struck. An alarm was pulled inside the school at about the same time by the dean to warn those already inside to take shelter. Student volleyball players were in the gymnasium when they rushed out of it and into the nearest sheltered hallway to take cover. In a moment that almost sounds like it came straight from a movie, a witness said that as soon as the last player was through the door, a coach closed it behind them, only for it to immediately be torn open and ripped off its hinges by the tornado as it plowed into the school, ripping into the gym that they had been in only seconds before. The tornado completely tore apart the gym and it came crashing down. Had anyone still been inside, they would have been buried and crushed under the rubble if they weren't sucked into the tornado outright. Thankfully, no one was, but... It was a very close call nonetheless, because when it had passed the school, only the hallway that the volleyball and football players were sheltering in was left standing in the wake of the tornado. The tornado also destroyed the Plainfield School District Administration Building, where a custodian's wife was killed. The tornado then moved away from the school, crossed Route 59, and then struck the St. Mary Immaculate Church in school, where three more people died, including a music teacher, the son of a cook, and the principal of the school. The tornado relentlessly continued on, with the cruel indifference and utter power of nature on full display for many to see as it did, and struck residential areas of Plainville. A total of 55 homes were destroyed in the city, and several of them were swept away completely, leaving their foundations bare. Jennifer Sari, who was two at the time, later recalled, we rushed over to my great-grandparents' house to find considerable damage to the house, garage, and the lake house completely blown away. My nana said that it was a nice late August day, humid but nothing out of the ordinary. She went outside through the walkout basement to go collect hail for us kids. When the sky turned dark and green, she went inside. The roof then lifted up and the garage wall fell in, landing on top of my papa Dominic who was still on the main floor. She found him and brought him downstairs just in case there was another storm approaching and where she thought it would be safe until family arrived. We collected their belongings, cleaned up the debris, and rebuilt their home. My parents decided to build a home right next to theirs shortly after. I grew up hearing the stories of that day and the frustrations of not receiving a warning in advance. They told me one day, I needed to help make a difference and save lives from severe weather. And she was right. The tornado did strike with little to truly no warning for those in town. Today we're blessed with having, say, a smartphone be able to buzz a warning to you instantly. But in 1990, sometimes receiving a warning was a lot, was a lot harder. And on this day, most had no warning. Most were robbed of something even as helpful as an actual sight of the tornado coming in the distance. Sometimes if you fail to receive any other warning, that can be enough. That can give you enough time to take cover, but 
on this day, the tornado could not be seen, and it hit them before most even knew it was there. Other damage in Plainfield itself by the time it was all over included toppled gravestones, and one that really stood out to me, a dumpster, which was thrown into a partially debarked tree with such sheer force that the metal had crumpled and bent around the trunk. In this area, the tornado received a high-end F4 damage rating. Even though the horror in Plainfield was over, the tornado itself wasn't done yet. As it moved out of Plainfield, it continued its relentless tear, moving from city to city like the invisible monster it was. After moving out of Plainfield, and then into Lily Cache, and then Crystal Lawns, and then it moved on to Crest Hill, where the tornado struck head-on just before 3.40 p.m. The Crest Hill Lakes apartment complex was struck head-on and destroyed. Here, the tornado left F3 rated damage amid the twisted wreckage in its wake. Two buildings on the complex were destroyed, and to this day, neither have been rebuilt. Looking at this exact path on Google Earth, if you were to zoom in and follow it, it might be just possible to still spot some of the other lingering scars from the tornado if you know what to look for. A faint path here or there, empty lots where homes once stood. Sometimes it's subtle, but oftentimes if you follow along a tornado's path with satellite imagery, even if it was long ago, you can still see the scars of it that have never fully healed. After passing through Crest Hill, the tornado continued on to the southeast, losing strength until the invisible monster finally lifted in Joliet. The thunderstorm that spawned the monster moved across the Indiana border and died a little under an hour later. The damage the tornado left behind was some of the most intense I've ever seen pictures of, and I've talked about some of the tornadoes Ted Fujita himself described as among the most intense he'd ever talked about, if that tells you anything. The tornado left damage that looks like the entire town was bombed, causing a total of $165 million of damage. Over 1,000 homes were damaged. An additional 470 were completely destroyed once it was all said and done in all the towns. 69 homes were destroyed by the tornado in Crystal Lawn, 75 in the Peerless Estates, 55 in Lily Cash, and another 50 in Warwick. The tornado was the first F5 since tornado rating records began to strike in August. And 29 people in total were killed by the tornado. And more than 300, perhaps as many as 350, were injured. The tornado left a 16.4 mile long damage path one that was at times up to half a mile wide. All this destruction and human suffering from an event that lasted only 30 minutes. That's not a lot of time, yet during it, some people's lives were forever changed, destroyed, or outright lost. All in less than an hour, and that's an important thing, I think, to remember. That this sudden hit affected real people with no warning and in mere seconds their lives were forever changed take a moment to think about the people themselves when we talk about stories like this it's easy to get lost in the overall spectacle of it all especially when something so intense on this kind of scale happens something that almost doesn't even sound real but the individual perspective is something just as important to remember to those who have shared personal tornado stories of their own in my comments before, thank you for bringing your part of those stories forward so we can remember them and what you've experienced. Some of you have shared outright terrifying stories in my comments before, and I'm honored you chose to share them with me. Thank you. And I think that's going to do it for this one. Next video, we will be discussing another disturbing story, but disturbing in a different way. The 1849 sinking of the brig, Hannah. Join me for that one next time. Like and subscribe if you enjoy videos on stories like this or creepy or scary kind of topics or obscure history because that's what I cover. And if you want to see more of it, it'll it's a good way to let me know. So, tell me the kinds of stories you might be interested in seeing covered. I do read all the comments and 
I have done multiple videos on suggestions before. So please, suggest what you want to see next. Thank you for watching, and have a good one, everyone.